So um, tonight we're talking on uh, wildlife safety for hunters. Um, we're going to also touch on a little bit of, uh, mostly this will be on bear safety tonight, but we will be uh, also focusing on moose safety and a little bit on wolf safety. Those are other two those are also other two species that we will encounter, potentially encounter in Southeast Alaska um, and other parts of the state. To introduce myself, my name's Abby McAllister. I'm an, a wildlife education and outreach specialist for Region 1, so I serve all of Southeast Alaska. I also do a little, uh, I help with um, other statewide projects as necessary, but basically, so what do I do? Well, um, it's my job to help communicate what uh, is happening within our department, with our biologists, with our research, uh, any important messages that, that we want the public to know about. It's my job to convey those. I also help coordinate skills-based classes such as Alaskans Afield, Becoming an Outdoor Woman, and um, do a little bit of wildlife safety, bear awareness, a little bit of everything. Um, before I came to this job, I was a journalist and an editor. I worked at the Juno Empire newspaper for uh, over a decade working as the outdoors editor and reporter writing on outdoors stories of all kinds. And Alaska has plenty of them. So that's a little bit about me. Roy, do you want to introduce yourself? This is my co-host, Roy. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'm the area biologist, the management biologist for wildlife uh, here in the Douglas office. And so I cover uh, the Douglas Juno area, which is actually quite large. Um, starting a little bit north of Petersburg, all the way past Yakutat. So uh, we manage all the hunts in that area, uh, as well as uh, taking care of nuisance animals, mostly bears, uh, black bears in Juno right now, um, take up a lot of my time. And, but I also get to uh, talk to the public and interact with folks in situations like this and uh, especially during the hunting season um, going out and talking to hunters uh, both as they're hunting and when they come back uh, from their trips. So as we get going and just to, like I mentioned I'm going to go over a couple housekeeping things so for everyone um, to have a good experience on the zoom uh, please leave your microphone muted if you do have a question please feel free to virtually raise your hand or feel free to send a chat and um, we'll answer it as we go along. There also will be um, a time for questions at the very end. We are recording this meeting, and um, so if you're comfortable with your video on, go for it. If not, you can you know, have it off. Um, no names will be shown on the video recording itself, and uh, we will make that video recording available via an online, online link later this week as soon as we can get it uploaded to the web. You can find that on our website, uh, but we will share the link to anyone who asks. You can email me at the end and I'd be happy to share that link with you. We'll also have it on our social media sites, Facebook and Instagram. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. So tonight, our, our biggest goal is really to increase overall wildlife safety in the field. Um, where Wherever you are, we hope that the the goals, or rather the information you take away tonight, you can put into practice and it'll serve you. Um, you know, our other goal is to help hunters reduce conflicts in bear, moose, and wolf country, specifically interactions with bears. And then really tonight, the presentation will have an emphasis on critical thinking and personal responsibility. When it comes to wildlife interactions, you are responsible for the outcome. And um, so those are some of the things that we hope to take away, you take away from tonight. Um, pardon me if I pause, I might, as people sometimes trickle into these presentations, I might pause to let people in from the waiting room. So if I pause, that's just what I'm doing. Uh, okay, so this is Southeast Alaska. Southeast Alaska is a vast region, diverse um, in its habitat type. And um, so here's, here's an, an aerial view, right? We, are a large kind of elongated archipelago. And I'm gonna see if I can't do a little, um, do a little, no, I can't do it. Sometimes you can do some markup on these slides, but hopefully you can see my cursor. And if not, I'll just kind of visual, I'll verbalize what I'm trying to tell you about where, what types of bears you might encounter in different parts of Southeast Alaska. Um, in the Northern portion, of, of the region, uh, you will find black, sorry, brown bears on the mainland. So kind of around Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve, 
um, up in the mainland area of Juneau, north of Juneau, you definitely will find brown bears. As you move down onto Chichikoff Island, you're going to run into a lot of brown bears. Uh, uh, Admiralty Island National Monument is pretty much famous for its brown bear population. Um, and then as you move south through the region, you will uh, get into um, uh, black bears toward the coastal end of the southern part of Southeast Alaska. Whereas um, as you move toward the mainland portion of Southern Southeast Alaska, you're going to encounter a mix of black bears and brown bears. Um, so basically what, what am I trying to say when it comes to the type of bear that you will run into is that it varies. Uh, you will run into both, but um, which one you're more likely to run into is gonna vary by the portion, the area of Southeast that you're in. So habitats in Southeast Alaska look a lot like this. Um, what we are, we're lucky to live in high quality bear habitat, but they're diverse. And so um, really it's, it's important to think about, you know, what kind of bear interaction you might have and what kind of level of awareness and heightened awareness you might have in, when you are in these different habitat types. So we have upper alpine areas uh, where you have a lot of, uh, you know, you a lot of range of sight uh, you're up, you're up above, you know, the forest itself, the dense forest, and you, you can see quite a long ways. Um, you're in a spongy kind of moss covered terrain where typically um, any kind of track won't last too terribly long, long or be too terribly obvious. Whereas the uh, image just to the right of that alpine shot, that is muskeg as well, but that's coastal muskeg. So what you're dealing with there is um, low growing, um, uh, pine trees and they're denser, chances of you having a long range of, of sight is, is less. Uh, down in the lower left, you have our true traditional rainforest of Southeast Alaska where vegetation is dense, canopy is high, uh, and while moving through this terrain might be challenging at times to be quiet, uh, you don't have um, a lot of range, a lot of good sight um, in, in this type of vegetation. And then the bottom right is, you know, the type of habitat that you might run into in an area like Prince of Wales or any areas of um, Admiralty or Chichigoff that may have been logged. Um, whereas on either side of this, this logging road, you do have pretty good um, sight. But once you get into that second growth, which just buffers that roadway, that is going to be some really dense, heavy, thick forest or um, second growth that you're going to have to move through. So taking stock of where you're hunting is, is important when it comes to um, taking the first step toward, um, toward uh, wildlife safety. Segwaying into bears in Alaska, right? So um, it doesn't, when it comes to bear behavior, it's not as much about um, what type of bear you're encountering, whether it be a black bear or a brown bear, but it is helpful to know uh, because both bears evolved a little differently. Um, when a black bear like the one pictured, uh, you know, they, they evolved in treed um, forested habitats. So they are, when they are, when they approach um, a potential threat, they're more likely to flee up a tree. Uh, whereas um, brown bears evolved in treeless habitats. And so um, what they find is that those bears are more likely to stand their ground um, if they feel threatened. So that's not always the case. Every bear is an individual, really. But um, it's, it's nice to know what type of bear you're dealing with. It's also nice to know because um, black bears are typically smaller in body size than brown bears. And so it's just kind of nice to know. Um, and, and there's different ways to tell them apart. So what type of bear are you dealing with? Um, on the left, we're looking at a black bear. And on the right, that is a brown bear. So as you can see, uh, a good way to tell them apart is just in their body shape. Um, typically, a, uh, a, a good way to tell is to look at the, the line along the top of their back. So a brown bear is going to have this, this muscle, this hump of muscle on its back, um, and it's la that's lacking in a black bear. Uh, they typically have a straight back. Also, their claws. So brown bears have dis a distinctly longer set of claws than a black bear. Um, while Black bears um, are typically better at climbing trees. Brown bears can also climb trees. Uh, brown bears use these um, elongated claws for digging, whether it be for roots or ground squirrels, clams, um, although both bears can do so. And then another way to tell a black bear from a brown bear is by the shape of the muzzle. And um, 
brown bears typically have, if they're facing you, they have more of this kind of dish shaped face um, with you know, a, a nose that comes down that's a little bit more blunted. Whereas a, uh, a black bear have from the side, really that, that nose is gonna look more elongated. The slope of that forehead out to um, the tip of the nose is gonna be a little bit more gradual. Um, and then when it comes to bear foods, both bear, bears feed on a variety of foods, um, anywhere from you know, blueberries, uh, salmon berries. In the spring, bears can be found on coastal areas foraging on very protein rich, uh, sedges and grasses. Um, and then um, as season progresses, bears will um, move towards salmon streams and um, forage on salmon. And then they also have been known to, to um, forage, or not forage, but rather hunt and kill uh, moose, moose calves, uh, deer, and um, fawns as well. So why do I talk about bear foods? Well, it's because it's important to understand as the season progresses where uh, you might, where and when you might run into a bear. If the salmon are running and you know you're in high quality bear habitat, use your common sense. Really be aware, look in that salmon stream and see if you see any signs of bear activity. Um, if it's late in the fall and you know that, that the natural foods have not been abundant um, as they have in past years, for example, this year in Southeast Alaska, I know that in northern area um, here in Juneau and, and, and this region, we have not had a good berry year this year. Our salmon runs are so-so. And in, in years like that, bears are gonna be entering um, what's called hyperphagia or pre-denning um, time, and they are gonna be a little hungrier than normal. And so um, not only are bears, you know, they have a variety of foods that they will pursue, they're also opportunistic. So as a hunter, that's something to keep in mind. So now segueing into staying safe in bear country. As a hunter, um, there's certain things you need to do because as, as you move through the woods, uh, you're at higher risk. You are moving um, quietly, you are stalking uh, your prey, and often you are wearing camouflage, so you are harder to see. Bears have eyesight that is as good as ours. Their sense of smell is fantastic. We say that it's about seven times better than a bloodhound, and their hearing is also really, really good. However, we are not making it easy for them to understand what we are. And so again, we're at higher risk. There's a story behind this photo, that's why I have it there. Um, this is one of my hunting partners from a past year's hunt. Um, this is him directly after uh, we were charged by a brown bear. And um, there's a couple things happening in this photo that I want to talk about. So um, what he's done well is that he has his secondary means of his, his preferred chosen uh, bear deterrent. And we'll talk more about this later, but we do recommend that as a hunter you carry, of course, you'll be carrying your firearm or your bow. But we also recommend that you carry a secondary form of, of deterrent. Um, in this case, he chose, chose a handgun. What you can't really see well, but underneath his binoculars is his handgun holster. So he not only has his rifle with him, but he also has his secondary bear deterrent very, very readily available to him. Um, I think he had dropped to his knees in this photo because out of relief, the bear, um, like many um, bear encounters, ended uneventfully. Uh, the bear um, had displayed some um, defensive behaviors that we didn't really identify at the time, but uh, did charge us, but then at the last moment veered off. That is a very, very common um, bear interaction. In this particular case, the other thing that was happening that, that probably led to a successful outcome is that um, he was part of a hunting party of four total people. Um, in this photo, we had been actively hunting up this game trail. So our packs were behind us. We were being very quiet, but it was a line of four people. Next to him were two individuals with their rifles raised, and then I was behind them with my, um, with my bear spray out. So what probably happened is that this bear saw a group of people, and this is what we tell people to do, do is group up. The, the bear saw a group of people and decided to change course. It had this person, had it been a person by themselves, the outcome may have been different because the person was by themselves. We'll go over all this um, in more detail. But I just wanted to kind of preface everything we're going to talk about by this photo, which I feel like kind of sums it up a little bit. Um, okay, what can you do in bear country? 
Well, first is stay aware and be prepared. Best thing you can do. Um, again, like I mentioned, hunters will be carrying a firearm or bow, but do consider carrying a second deterrent such as bear spray and have it readily accessible. The, the second deterrent that I carry is bear spray. Why? Because um, I know that I am confident in using that. I have practiced, it's light. Um, I'm not a, a big person, so it's nice to be able to shed weight where you can. And I wear it on my hip on the opposite side of where I carry my rifle. Um, so it's accessible, it's out of the way, and it's light, it doesn't get caught on a bunch of stuff. Uh, be aware that when using game calls for deer, moose, or other animals, you may also call in bears. You're out there looking for deer in the fall, you're out there looking for moose, bears are doing the exact same thing. So they may actually come toward you thinking that you are their prey. Just know that, be aware of that. Hunt with a partner, ideally a trio. As you saw in that photo, there was a positive outcome with that, um, that bear that veered off after charging. Like I said, probably because they, the bear did see that there was more than one person there. Um, hunting with a partner is not only safer, um, but it also does um, lessen the potential for a negative outcome should you encounter a bear. Um, and then, you know, as you're hunting, it's not uncommon for, um, you know, two hunters or three to just kind of spread out along um, a draw or along a ridge line, and that's okay. Just make sure that when you're doing that, that you can see your hunting partners at all times, that you know that where they are, not only for good hunter safety practices, but also just kind of keeping an eye on everything that's going on. And then of course, not only are you doing that, but you're using all your senses to stay aware and observant. Hunters are naturally observant. Hunters are on high alert at all times, but make sure that you're not just looking for deer tracks and fresh sign, that you're also taking note of other sign of other things like bears that might be nearby. Here's some examples. So um, things you can look for are scratching, scratch marks on trees. Bears use trees to mark territory. They'll rub up on, rub against them, um, scratch them. Uh, pay attention to scat piles. This one in the lower left um, is a late fall uh, bear scat pile. And then of course tracks. Um, that is a brown bear track and you can tell by um, the distance uh, in the claws from the toe pads um, and also the alignment of the toe pads. So I talked a little bit about the difference between uh, black bears and brown bears. So if you're looking at this is the front paw of a brown bear, if this were a black bear paw, what you would see is the toe pads making a little bit more curved, um, curved pattern across in the mud here. And those claws would be a little bit closer to those toe pads. This is definitely the front paw of a brown bear and those toe pads, as you can see, make a pretty straight line. And those claw marks are a little bit further ahead, indicating that those are larger, longer claws. So again, just staying aware and being prepared. The other thing I like to talk about when, is, when, I'm, when I'm talking about using your senses, it's not just your sense of sight, it's also your sense of smell. Um, you know, if something's really stinky, that could be that there's a carcass somewhere, whether it was that carcass or that um, dead animal was created by another hunter, uh, it could be a gut pile, or it was created by a bear. Either way, use that sense of smell. And if you do smell something terrible, I would recommend backing off. Uh, the other thing is, of course, use your ears, but then also that other sense that I call the spidey sense, okay? That's the same sense that you might get if you're, say, speeding down the road and you, that little voice pops up in your head and says, you know, you might want to slow down. There might be a cop around. You do, and then you go around the corner and there happens to be a cop, right? Or when you're moving through the woods and you get kind of the, the hair sticking up on the back of your neck and you think, kind of feel like something's off here. Maybe the forest just got really quiet. Maybe the squirrels aren't chattering anymore. Keep, keep those senses going too. Um, or maybe you do see a bunch of ravens or crows in a tree. That could be an indication that there's something dead nearby. Again, use those senses. So um, I, on this slide, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Roy. We're taking turns presenting tonight. But Roy's gonna talk a little bit about um, how your your behavior, as I mentioned earlier, really does influence the outcome of a bear encounter. All right. Great, thanks, Abby. You're welcome. Um, yeah, so um, as she said, your behavior can really influence um, the out outcome 
of a bear encounter. And so we're going to go over a few different situations um, and how you should best react in those situations to make sure uh, that it comes out uh, in the best way that it can for you. Um, so first of all, you want to stay calm and don't panic. Um, that calmness, bears can sense that. And so it's good for, for you to stay as calm as possible. And then always, um, yeah, never run from a bear no matter what. So you always want to want to stand your ground and uh, keep keep um, looking forward towards them. So uh, if the bear doesn't happen to notice you uh, and you can sneak away without uh, it um, sensing you, which does happen on occasion, um, that's a, a good way to go. Um, but even in those situations, you know, a bear could sense you as you're trying to sneak away. So you do want to get your deterrent ready and keep your eyes on the bear as you're uh, leaving the area. And if the bear does notice you, um, that's your time to uh, stop. Um, hopefully your deterrent was already ready, but if it's not, you want to uh, get that uh, ready um, in case the bear decides to, to approach you. Um, and then once again, uh, face the bear. If you're in a group of people, like uh, we suggested, you should get together. Um, larger groups of close-knit people um, are more uh, uh, intimidating, intimidating uh, to the bear. Um, and then at that point, once the bear has seen you, you want the bear to know that you're a human, so you should talk to it. That's the best. Uh, way to tell the bear that, that you are a human. Um, so you talk calmly, uh, but firmly. So at least at this point, you kind of want to stay calm. You don't need to yell at the bear yet, um, but you do want to talk in a firm voice. I think, Abby, I'll need you to move sure. the slide forward for me. Yeah, you got it. OK. OK, so um, we do break bear behavior uh, into two different types. And so the first one we're going to go over is the defensive bear. Um, and then uh, just so you know, the next one we'll talk about is a non-defensive bear. But um, to start with, let's talk about defensive bears. And so defensive bears are those that um, you may have just surprised um, or starting to crowd be basically getting into their bubble or their space um, in the area that they don't want humans in, or even sometimes other bears or other animals they'll react to. Um, but bears do have a bubble just like humans do, uh, an area where they feel like they should be the only animal present. Uh, and if you get into that area, um, they may uh, become um, defensive. So um, other things that may make a bear uh, defensive are uh, if it has uh, cubs. So females are often will defend their cubs. And then if they're on a carcass as well, they're, they're, uh, it's very common for especially brown bears to defend a carcass. Here in Juneau, we see that um, some bears will defend trash cans and, uh, and all those things. Uh, so um, yeah, just a few things to consider. Uh, and so a bear that is defensive will show certain characteristics. Uh, they'll often huff at you and stomp their front feet, trying to let you know that they're unhappy. Um, they'll pop their jaws and their teeth. Um, they often salivate uh, and while they're popping their jaws. Their ears will be laid back, uh, telling you uh, basically that they're unhappy with you. And then um, often uh, we'll get something that we'll call sometimes call a false charge, um, which is actually a real charge, but they don't come all the way to you. They'll often stop and uh, veer off before they uh, make contact. So, and then uh, we can go to the next slide. And so, um, as I mentioned, we're also gonna describe a, a non-defensive bear. 
And so non-defensive bears um, may approach you. Sometimes they'll be uh, curious bears that are wondering what you are. Uh, you could also be on a travel route, uh, like if you're on a trail um, and a bear is coming down the trail, uh, a non-defensive bear will approach you, uh, maybe just because it wants to use that trail. Um, they may be curious and are just trying to figure out what you are, uh, but especially young bears, sometimes will also be testing their dominance. Um, and so they'll approach you just to uh, test, um, to try to see if they're more dominant than you. And then also food condition bears that are used to getting food, um, human foods, uh, and those bears are often pretty used to humans. And so those can also be non-defensive bear bears. And then also we describe uh, potential predatory situations as non-defensive uh, bear situations. And so these bears um, are often gonna approach you silently, unlike um, our last situation, in this case, the ears, the ears of the bear will be up. And so they're very alert and trying to hear everything, smell everything and see everything. Um, their eyes will be focused on you and so they won't be um, swinging their head back and forth and sal salivating uh, like in the previous um, situation. And instead of kind of circling around or uh, veering kind of away from you, uh, these non-defensive bears will be deliberately going right towards you. So then we can go to the next slide. And so what do you want to do in these different situations? Um, for the most part, we start off the same. Uh, and so both in defensive and non-defensive bear situations, the first thing you want to do is stop. Um, you want to basically calm yourself down, let the bear know that you're there, um, and uh, focus in on the bear. And so the next thing is to ready your deterrent. Um, so Right after you realize that you're in a bear situation, you want to be prepared to do what you need to do. Um, so you should have that. Uh, then you want to let the bear know that you're a human. So if you're in a group, you group up and make that group uh, as close knit as possible while talking in a calm voice. And then watching the bear, um, you do not run. If this is a defensive bear situation, you're going to deploy um, your deterrent. If it comes uh, into what we might consider your bubble, um, you know, different people have different, uh, just a different willingness to let bears get a certain distance away from them. Um, but say if you're using bear spray, um, you know, uh, that can work from uh, 20 to 30 feet. Um, and if that's how comfortable you feel you should let a bear be, then you can uh, deploy your deterrent at, at that distance. Um, and then for a non-defensive bear, if a bear continues to approach um, and it's getting into what, we, what you consider to be uh, your bubble, you should up your game um, and do what you need to do to drive that bear off. So, a lot of things that you might do in that situation, we talked about talking in a calm voice earlier, but at this point, you can start yelling, um, stomping your feet, clapping your hands. Um, if you, if there's like a stump or rocks around, you can get up on the rocks and make yourself look bigger. Um, and everyone should be doing that uh, if you're in a group. And then uh, once in that non-defensive situation, uh, if the bear continues to come after you've upped your game as high as you can up it, I guess, um, it's, that's your uh, time to deploy your deterrent. So if that bear continues to come after you've uh, deployed your deterrent, um, the, in the defensive bear attack situation, uh, basically, if it comes all the way up to you and makes contact with you, uh, you should lie uh, face down on the ground with your hands clasped behind your neck. Uh, you want to spread your, your legs and elbows out uh, so 
we're trying to make it so it can't roll you uh, around up so that you have your stomach up. Uh, that's the purpose of that. And then also you want to be, if you can, uh, as quiet and calm as possible. So you don't want to struggle or quiet or cry out. You want to remain uh, as still as you can. Um, and once the bear leaves, you don't want to move. You want to um, basically stay there uh, for as long as you think the bear might be anywhere in the area. You want the bear to be totally gone before, before you move. Um, the goal here is to uh, deflate the situation so that uh, there's no, absolutely no threat uh, to the bear uh, before you move. And so hopefully it has calmed down, left the area, and then you can uh, uh, get up and, and leave. And here's a good picture of um, kind of that, that positioning. Um, you know, if you have a backpack, uh, it's good to keep that on your back. Um, for one, so a bear doesn't take it and, and take it away, but it also protects uh, your back and, and neck area if you have that backpack up there uh, on your back. Um, and yeah. Then in a predatory attack si situation, um, if a bear makes contact with you, um, and it and and it doesn't uh, seem to be uh, in a defensive situation. Basically, you have the one option, and that's to try to fight the bear off um, with any means available. Um, if you have a pocket knife, or I mean, at this point, you've used your deterrent. So whether that's a firearm or bear spray, um, that's usually not available any longer. Um, you know, if you have a rock or anything you can get your hands on, um, you want to try to punch or hit the bear um, with those things, even if it's just your hand. Um, and places you want to concentrate that are on the face of the bear, um, the eyes and the nose of the bear, um, whatever uh, you can at that point. It's um, kicking and punching and whatever you can do. And so um, just to kind of go over those again, uh, we'll talk about that. So let's review what you do when you encounter a bear in a defensive situation. So once again, that's um, a case where a bear um, is maybe guarding a carcass or it's uh, young, um, but basically you've surprised it. Um, and so you need to stop and assess the situation, uh, ready your deterrent, you want this bear to know that you're a human, uh, so you will talk to it in a calm voice uh, and group up with other folks that are in your group. And then watch the bear and uh, don't run. If the bear continues to approach you or does a false charge that gets into what you consider to be your bubble, it's that's the time to uh, deploy your deterrent. And then uh, the opposite is what you would want to do if uh, we're in a non-defensive bear situation. And so both of these start out the same where you stop and assess the situation, deciding if it's non-defensive or defensive. In this case, we're describing a non-defensive bear uh, that's going to be keyed in on you. Um, you're going to ready your deterrent and talk to it in a calm voice and group up so it knows that you are a group of humans uh, that are uh, there. You're going to watch the bear and you're not going to run. Um, if this defensive bear keeps uh, coming in close to you uh, and focused on you, uh, you're going to up your game, stomp your feet, clap your hands, start yelling at it, and then when it reaches a, a point where it's in your personal bubble, um, you, that's your time to deploy your deterrent. And so, um, yeah, you want to, when you're out in a hunting situation, you always want to be aware um, and be prepared uh, for, for what can, can happen out there. Um, you know, it's easy to get uh, all tied up in the situation and you know both of you might be skinning an animal or in this case like one person's 
calling me and another person might be busy looking down doing another thing um it's it's uh better if you can kind of have someone uh designated as the person who's keeping an eye out um in these situations uh we do hear stories about uh, bears that key in on gunshots um out on admiralty uh and so once they hear or smell that an animal's down they can um uh, come in thinking that they're going to get some food uh, and so it helps to have um, someone that can can keep an eye out while the other person's uh, doing the work and so things to think about while you're out hunting and harvesting animals um, first of all you want to make a plan you want someone to know where you are uh, where you're going and when you're expected back so that if something does happen, um, you have someone looking out for you and they know where to, to, to look and see uh, where you are, whether that's uh, you have an issue with a bear or um, your battery dies on your vehicle, all these things. Uh, it's good to, that people know uh, where to find you. When you're out in the woods, you want to uh, be aware, you want to look for a sign of the animal you're hunting, as well as a uh, bear sign. Um, and you can look for scat and tracks and, and you know, sometimes you'll see a tuft of fur sticking off a branch. Um, there's all kinds of things that uh, can indicate that there's a bear around. Um, bears can be very quiet, but they can also be pretty noisy, ripping trees apart to get ants out of them. Uh, those are all things that you might hear from some distance away. And then, as we were just talking about, it's good to have a lookout. So if there are two of you, um, you know, you can have one person that's kind of, uh, he might be able to do a few things, but it's good if they spend a bunch of their time um, keeping an eye out uh, in the area to see if bears are approaching, while the other person is uh, doing uh, more concentrated work where they need to focus on what they're doing. If you can help it, it's good not to create a blood trail. Um, and so if you have the option of packing an animal out uh, versus dragging it, it's better to uh, get it up off the ground uh, so that you're not dragging that scent um, across the ground for a bear to come across and be able to um, track you down. And then you should treat uh, any bloody clothes that you have as an attractant. So if you are ex uh, expecting to camp out uh, that evening, you don't want to keep your bloody clothes on um, and take them into your tent. You should keep them either with the meat or stash them with your food uh, so they're in a protected place um, where if a bear smells them, um, the bear won't be able to get to them. And then uh, bears often do go for the entral entrails first. Uh, so if you can cut and quarter your meat as soon as possible and then move that edible meat uh, to a different location, um, that will leave the, the gut pile for um, bears to be able to have um, while you are able to take the, the part of the game that you want uh, to take it away. Um, if you do create a meat cache, um, it's good to flag all of those, uh, especially if you're making multiple trips and that kind of knows you, helps you uh, know where you're going and gives you something to look ahead at so that um, you uh, can kind of check out the area before you're dropping into uh, a meat cache or a gut pile um, so that you can look for bears uh, there. And the flagging will help other hunters too. Um, if they're uh, walking through the area, it might alert them that there uh, is a, a meat cache there and they can look around and hopefully spot a bear if it was in the area. Once you're in camp, you wanna cache the meat uh, out of reach of bears. And so you can hang it in a tree um, usually. Uh, and if you can't, you do wanna keep it uh, away from camp uh, where it's uh, going to be far enough away that a bear, um, if it goes into the meat, 
to check out the meet. Um, it's not going to be uh, right where you are in the camp. One thing that is good to think about, though, is uh, having a clear line of sight from the camp um, to where the meat is cached so that if something starts happening, you can see uh, right to that location without having to walk a little ways or uh, go around a bunch of bushes. Um, and so you can uh, easily uh, check it out. And then we do uh, suggest that people consider using portable electric fences. You can uh, have one around your sleeping area where you're pitching your tents, but also have one around your uh, meat to protect that. And so that's uh, a really good thing to consider. And then when you're camping, um, you need to pick a safe campsite. And so you do want to avoid bear trails um, or areas where you see uh, fish waste um, along salmon streams where bears have been fishing. Um, they'll often leave parts of uh, salmon carcasses on the bank. So you know that that's a, a common uh, fishing spot for bears. And then you also want to be aware of narrow uh, beaches because those are often trails for uh, bears to go up and down the river. And so you want to allow plenty of, of room for bears to go um, up and down and, and use their, their trails. When you do, uh, when you are camping, you want to keep as clean a camp as you can. Uh, so you don't want to leave any trace. You want to pick up all of uh, any food um, or anything that will leave food smells uh, and pack all of that out. Um, if you have garbage, you should uh, stow it uh, with your uh, food while you're, while you're camping. And then we suggest that you use uh, what we call a triangle method uh, when possible when you're setting up your camp. And so we can go to the first one. You want to think about the general direction of the wind um, when you're doing that. And then you'll set up your uh, tent uh, in one location. Um, so that it's uh, behind the wind and then you want your meat cache um, to be, as we said, someplace that you can see uh, but out away from camp, you know, at least, you know, like 100 or 100 yards or so. Um, and then you, when you're cooking, you want to cook uh, downwind uh, from where you're going to sleep um, so you're not having the food smells um, waft across your camp and past your camp so that a bear has to come up through your, your tenting, your tent spot to uh, get there. And then where you store your food, you could store the meat and the food in the same location if you wanted, or you can separate them. Um, but you do, uh, it is good to, to have all three of those locations uh, in a different spot. And so uh, it, it's nice if you can to have all those locations uh, visible um, to each other so you can you can see all those spots from where your tent is uh, if you can but yeah do the best that you can so when you are storing your food when you're camping it's good to use uh, bear resistant food containers and so there's a few different types here on the right and you do, if you can, want to hang uh, your food uh, when it's possible. And so here is a, it looks like a camping spot where they made it possible to hang food up. And then you want to keep garbage and dirty dishes and toiletries all away from uh, where you're sleeping. So it's good to keep all those things uh, with the food as well. And so even things like toothpaste or shampoo uh, deodorant, all those things shouldn't be in your tent. Um, it's good to keep those all up uh, in, in the food because uh, bears will be attracted to those as well. I wanted to talk a little bit about electric fences and um, some different configurations that you can use to set them up. Um, they're really effective uh, for keeping bears out. We've I've used them personally a lot on the North Slope uh, for grizzly bears and polar bears. Um, and we use them a lot here in Juneau to pre protect uh, livestock and chickens. Uh, and I've watched several bears uh, hit an electric fence and 
I've seen bears that have know what electric fence is and they just walk right around it, not wanting to have anything to do with it. So they are quite effective. Um, some things to think about when you're setting up an electric fence. Uh, we recommend that you have about at least three strands of wire. So the bottom one should be at least uh, 10 inches off the ground. And you should also consider when you're making, um, whether it's a square or a circle, um, that the things that are inside your fence are at least uh, three to four feet away from the fence so that you don't have a bear uh, reaching under that 10 inches um, and being able to grab something and pull it uh, towards the fence. Make sure you have the energizer and grounding rod on the inside of the fence. And so, for example, if you had the grounding rod on the outside, a bear could come along and uh, mess with the grounding rod and knock the wire off uh, and then the fence wouldn't work. You do need to clear any vegetation um, that might touch the fence because that will short it out, uh, make the fence uh, either not work or work less effectively and make sure that you bring extra batteries. Um, these fences are great, uh, but they can uh, work through uh, batteries pretty well, um, depending on the, bra the brand. Um, and yeah, different, different ones work, uh, work through batteries uh, more or less. Um, so it's, yeah, always good to have extra batteries. And then always test your fence. Uh, it's good to have a tester. Um, of course, if you're backpacking a long ways, even that little tiny bit of weight may be something you don't want to carry with you. Um, so in those cases, my method is just to give it a light touch and see if it gives you a good jolt or not. Um, and then uh, Finally, electric fences aren't a substitute for a clean camp. Uh, there's nothing better than just having everything uh, up in a tree that might attract a bear and uh, keeping your sleeping area perfectly clean of smells and things that might attract a bear. And then if you are obviously in a hunting situation, you're gonna have your meat uh, off in a, another direction. So, okay, Abby. And then let's talk a little bit about the differences between bear spray uh, and a firearm. And so there has been a fair bit of research on this. Um, since 1992, research uh, has shown that encounters that use uh, defense with a firearm had a 50% uh, resulted in an injury. But during that same time frame, um, those folks that use bear spray, um, nearly all escaped uninjured or with only minor injuries. And in those bear spray situations, the attacks did not last as long uh, as they did when a person was using a firearm. And so if you think about it, bear spray is kind of like uh, wearing a seatbelt. And so um, it just uh, helps you um, in that you, <laughs> I kind of forgot where Abby was going with this. Um, <laughs> I can fill in if you want. So I mean, yeah, that'd be great. Sure. So the bear spray like a seatbelt is, you know, wearing a seatbelt in your vehicle is not going to prevent you from say, you know, that idiot driver that runs into you. But if that accident were to happen, that bear spray, sorry, not the bear spray, the uh, seatbelt is going to make it less likely for you to have a really terrible injury. Um, so bear spray is not a guarantee that the outcome of a negative bear encounter, should that bear make contact with you, is going to be, you know, you're not going to get off scot-free necessarily, but what it will do is uh, they have found um, consistently that bear spray not only reduces in fewer injuries to the individual, but those injuries are also much more minor and also that attack did not last as long. Um, and then of course, in the end, awareness of bear behavior and, and your response to that bear behavior is, is the best preventative measure. Um, the other thing I will just add about bear spray versus firearm is, is one little thing. Uh, you know, I, when you, as you can see by this photo, when you deploy bear spray, you're deploying a cloud. 
a cloud that that animal has to go through to get to you. Um, when you have a one-on-one -on -one situation, that's pretty effective. That's a big area. Whereas if you are using a firearm, unless you are a really good shot with that firearm in a very high, highly tense situation, you may not, that bullet may not land exactly where you want it to. And you could end up exacerbating the situation. You could end up making that bear even more angry than it already was. Um, so I feel more comfortable with bear spray because I know that I have this huge wall that I just created that that bear has to go through to get to me. Additionally, uh, when you think about it in a situation where you might be hunting with a partner, perhaps that bear um, makes contact with your hunting partner. Um, you know, I feel much more comfortable using bear spray to get that bear off of my hunting partner than a firearm. Yes, will my hunting partner get, you know, highly uncomfortable as a result of the capsicum, that pepper in that bear spray? Absolutely. But I'm not going to mortally wound him or make the situation worse for him or her. Will that bear probably also um, stop the attack or will that attack last less, you know, not quite as long? Definitely. So I choose um, bear spray not only because of the research, but also just because when I look at the different scenarios, I have much, much higher level of confidence with bear spray. Um, so that's, that's my spiel on bear spray. And I will also add that the active ingredient in bear spray is capsicum, um, that there is an ex expiration date on bear sprays. So if you have a can that's been hanging around in your garage for a little while, go ahead and look at that fine print um, on the can and, and see when it, if it is you know, still active. Bear spray will still work even if uh, it is expired. What happens is that is just the distance that it, um, that, it got, that it sprays, as you can see in this photo, is not quite as far. That propellant is not quite as powerful. And potentially um, the potency of the bear spray may not be quite as high as, as an unexpired can. Um, and basically, you know, bear spray not only works on bear spray, it also works on many other wild animals, such as moose and wolves and all kinds of things. So uh, for me, I, I just find that, um, you know, when, when in a hunting situation, that will be my go-to secondary deterrent for sure. Um, all right, Roy, you can take it back again. Um, yeah, no problem. I feel on bear spray. <laughs> Thanks for saving me there. Uh, yeah, and they have done quite a few studies and they find that most, more people are comfortable uh, using bear spray in stressful bear situations than they are than folks are with firearms, but it depends on your what you choose and and what you're most comfortable with. So we also wanted to talk a little bit about fishing. Um, so once again, uh, we always are opponents of uh doing these things uh with multiple people because it once you get in a bear situation you're safer if you're with other people um when you're fishing it's good to carry a deterrent uh whatever actually uh two deterrents if you can um uh because it's good to to have those available uh once you are um catch your fish it's good to clean your catch uh right on the shoreline and then um, once you get the guts and stuff out, if you can throw those out into some fast moving water, um, that uh, will make them go downstream and, and uh, bears won't associate uh, the, those, that possible food source um, with uh, people gutting fish. And then um, keep your fish and your coolers nearby. And so you don't wanna be uh, fishing, you know, like 40 yards away from where your stringer of fish are because that's plenty close enough for a bear to sneak in and, and grab your fish while you're fishing and you won't have an opportunity uh, to keep the bear away from those fish. If a bear does approach you um, while you have a fish on and it looks like it wants to grab the fish uh, that's on your line, you should just cut the line, let the fish go uh, so that a bear um, doesn't get a reward uh, from you as you're pulling in that fish because they'll learn uh, that that's a feeding opportunity um, and that will become one of their behaviors if, if you don't do that. All right, so uh, we've talked a lot of bit about a lot about bears. Um, we're gonna transition into just a little bit about a couple other species um, and 
uh, how you would respond um, if you get in a situation, uh, for example, we'll start with moose, um, what you would do if uh, you get close to a moose and it uh, becomes aggressive. And so here's a couple pictures of moose that um, are unhappy uh, with the photographer in this case, or in these two cases, uh, and they don't want that Basically, that person is in their bubble. Um, they'll have their hackles up, their ears back. Uh, they may not necessarily be looking straight on at you, but they will be uh, keeping you uh, in, in focus uh, and watching you, even though it may be from the side. And so this is your time to uh, slowly back away uh, and let the moose have their space uh, and let them um, do their thing. So I think this is the last slide, but if um, a moose, if this situation um, continues to deteriorate and the moose decides to charge you, uh, when a moose charges, you should run and try to get uh, a tree or a bush or anything you can, a fence uh, between you uh, and the moose so that uh, there's some kind of obstruction so that it can't get to you. So. Unlike bears, um, if a moose chases you, uh, you should run and try and get away from it. And then wolves, um, we don't have a lot to say about wolves other than if a wolf approaches you, um, I guess you could think about it as similar to being um, a non-defensive bear. You want to uh, group up, uh, let the let the wolf know that you are a human, um, and as it gets closer, you should try to deter the wolf from getting closer. Um, start uh, upping your game, yelling at it, uh, etc. Um, just as you would uh, with a defensive bear, or sorry, non-defensive bear, um, and. Um, yeah, if you have a deterrent, um, there may be a point where you decide to um, deploy that deterrent, whether it's bear spray or, or firearm, uh, depending on uh, what the situation is. Yeah. Uh, finally, we'll just wrap up here. We have a few uh, contact, uh, some contact information for us if you get in situations uh, where you need this. Um, you know, if you have a cell reception, you can uh, call 911 uh, if you're in a uh, life-threatening situation. Um, here in Juneau, uh, the police department will uh, respond to a 911 call. If you're a little farther out, uh, the state troopers will hopefully be able to uh, respond to that, um, just depending on uh, where you're at. Um, the Non-emergency line for uh, the Juno de Police Department is there um, as well as the state trooper um, non-emergency line. And then if you have a wildlife interaction that you want to report to Fish and Game, uh, you can go to our website and report that online. If you want to contact me, you can get a hold of me uh, at my uh, web, uh, my email. Roy Churchwell at Alaska.gov, um, or you can call our main office, um, and we're available uh, between 8 and 4.30 during most work days. And I just wanted to add, if I could, you know, we talked a little bit about um, letting people, someone know where you're going and when you'll be back in a hunting situation. And, and what we should add to this slide is that you can always report your hunt plan. If you don't have anyone else to tell, um, you can always report your hunt plan to the, uh, the Coast Guard. And um, you can file, I believe that they have a document actually you can download online and fill out and submit to them and let them know where you're going and when you'll be back. And I know people who have done that. And then of course, the piece with that is that if you do let them know, you submit a hunt plan with, the, with them, you wanna make sure you let them know that you have come back from your hunt, just as you would with someone else. Um, and you know, the other thing I might mention is that this is a good um, slide to go ahead and snap a photo of um, with your cell phone or your, your smartphone or, do a screenshot of that. Uh, this is a handy one to have. And then, um, you know, if you want to contact us, uh, here's our contact information. If you do want to have a link to this uh, 
presentation. Once it's made available, feel free to email me. Um, or if you have any other questions, any questions that you we didn't touch on tonight, um, or that you know any topics that you want to discuss more in depth, um, or if, actually if you want any um, uh, documents. So we we talked a little bit about um, firearm versus bear spray. That comes from um, from a document that I can share with anyone if they want to read the full paper on it. Um, and so yeah, here's our contact information. Feel free to screenshot this or take a photo with your cell phone and and do and do reach out to us because really we are here to help. And so with that, Roy, do you have anything else? Uh, I think that's about it. We um, we are going to give folks opportunity to ask questions, I believe. Yeah, and so we are at right o'clock at eight o'clock rather. So I just wanted to um, you know let you know. Feel free, ask some questions. We're here, um, but if you do have to get going because we are on the hour, we understand that as well. Um, but thank you, everyone. <laughs>